Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to MS Nerd TV. And if this is your first night joining us, welcome. Um, my name is Jennifer Falk. I'm the Director of Development over at MS News and News. And um, we're all really glad that you are joining us tonight. We hope you're all safe and well at home, uh, especially during this time. We feel it's so important that we all connect and come together and continue to learn uh, while we're on this journey. So. Um, Tonight, we're going to be uh, discussing uh, MS progression and what we know today. And a lot of your questions have come in uh, in relation to the COVID-19 um, virus and, of course, how that can um, affect uh, MS and MS progression. And that's definitely something that Connie is prepared to answer for you. Um, just to give you a little background, MS Views and News is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing education and information to the multiple sclerosis community. And before we go any further, we want to uh, thank Santa Fe Genzyme and Novartis for their support of MS Nerd TV and uh, allowing us to continue to provide educational programs like this. And um, tonight we are very honored to have um, Connie Easterling, who is an ARNP um, nurse practitioner who has worked with people living with MS for over 20 years. And uh, she is such an expert and so knowledgeable. And she is over at the Neurological Services of Orlando. Um, so she's really excited to be on with you all tonight as well. And so what we're going to do is start by playing an interview between Connie and Stuart Schlossman, the um, founder of MS News and News. And um, they're going to be going back and forth on some, some interesting facts. And as they talk, please just try to think about what questions you have. Uh, you have a question box that you see on the right-hand side. Uh, any questions that you have, just start typing them out for me. I have received a lot of your questions in advance. Um, I will get to the questions um, right after that video. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're gonna start right now to play that video and um, I'll see you on the other side. Good evening, everybody. I'm Stuart Schlossman from MS Views and News, and we're here tonight with Connie Easterling, a very, very well-known nurse practitioner from the Orlando, Florida area, and we're going to be speaking about MS progression and what we know today. So let's start off with this nice, simple question. In talking about disease progression in MS, a question that often comes up about how someone can recognize the progression. Are there any symptoms that can say, hey, I'm progressing? Well, and uh, there are. So from a clinician p uh, perspective, we see progression as uh, poor recovery from relapses or progression over time. And it, we see it on examination. We may see new lesions on the MRI. And we may see um, increased burden of disease or atrophy of the brain. But for the patient, it's all about quality of life. And so they may not recognize it, often don't recognize progression. And then all of a sudden, they can't do something they did before. They can't uh, walk through the mall like they used to, or um, they can't help their children with homework because they get confused or they uh, they don't want to feel stupid but they can uh, once they start seeing a change in their ability to do things and they have to change um, their and their quality of life goes down then they come in and they say um, something's changed and we usually recognize that on exam um, but there's not just one symptom. They can have an increase in bowel and bladder symptoms. They can have increase in heaviness in their legs when they walk. They can see some cognitive changes. So it runs the gamut as, for, as far as symptoms, but they don't remit. They don't resolve over time. Okay, but there are a lot of patients out there that I see as well mm -hmm. that do not recognize right. that they're getting worse. That's right. And they may be using mobility devices now and not a year ago, and yet they still do not recognize the disease right. progression. That's correct. How do you as a clinician mm -hmm. get them to understand this? And I'll give you an example. I have a 44-year-old 
woman. She's been our patient for about five years. We diagnosed her with MS. And she always had a little weakness in her right leg. So she refused treatment, refused treatment, refused treatment. And so last year I said to her, how do you think you're doing without treatment? Oh, I'm fine. The problem was she's wearing an AFO now. Mm -hmm. She uses a cane and her leg, her right leg has become significantly worse. And so I said, well, I want you to think about what you looked like four years ago and what you look like now. Sure. And so finally she agreed to treatment and uh, she's been on treatment now for about two months. Great. So. So but that's great that she's on the treatment and mm -hmm. thank you for that answer but how do you get like if the patient is living with somebody whether they're married or just mm -hmm. living with a mm -hmm. per, with another person um, do you how do you get the care partner to understand and be able to voice what's going on with the patient that's very interesting because some patients won't bring their care partner but when they come I ask every time please bring your spouse or your significant other because we can see that there may be changes like cognitive changes sure. or progression and we need to talk about that and knowing um, the perspective of what's going on in the home helps us and it helps the patient recognize when they hear their partner saying something they haven't said before. Mm -hmm. That really is, is significant to patients. So, so we may uh, call the partners and invite them to come because at some point it's going to become significant and the patient's going to need assistance in the home or uh, outside the home and we want to include that care partner as much as possible, or the family. Sometimes it's teenage kids. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the difference between relapse remitting MS or yes. RRMS, mm -hmm. secondary progressive, mm -hmm. also known as SPMS, <laughs> primary progressive, also known as, uh, what do we call it, primary progressive PPMS, <clears throat> and now the new active okay. secondary? So now we have a, a relapsing remitting MS is, is um, a type of MS where you have new symptoms and there may be changes or, or lesions on MRI and it's an inflammatory type of MS whereas over time you, the symptoms either uh, remit fully or partially and um, but generally uh, or there may be progression over time but there it's it's um, it's rela it's usually seen with relapses of new symptoms that usually resolve over time. Primary progressive disease is a disease in which there is progression over time. It's just a gradual progression and a slow progression often. They rarely have new lesions on the brain. They rarely have uh, a type of relapse. There may be plateaus. There may be a sudden increase in disability over time, but generally it's a progression of ongoing disability. And then secondary progressive is a type of MS where the patient started out with uh, relapsing MS, but sometime between 7 and 20 years after their first symptom, they don't have any relapses, but they have progression of their disease. Mm -hmm. They'll come in and they'll say, I'm having a relapse, no change on MRI, but what happens in the early years of the, of the, of the MS, the burden of disease, the lesions that accrue over time become the problem. And then they start showing new symptoms or progression of old symptoms that don't go away. Gotcha. And that's secondary progressive. Um, active primary progressive is, and that's very difficult to diagnose. So. Um, those individuals, there's a some there's a um, not a consensus on that. Um, most of us think that if there's a new lesion, like uh, an, an inflammatory lesion, that is progression. But now we know that primary progressive patients have more possibly more gray matter disease. So in the community, we don't always we can't always see. Uh, gray matter disease, but there are certain places on the brain on the MRI that we look for it. And so um, if there is atrophy of the brain, if there is hypointense lesions um, that weren't there before, we generally consider that active. Um, but some, there isn't a consensus on that answer. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Can you please tell us what new DMTs, disease-modifying okay. treatments, mm -hmm. um, have been approved for 
um, PPMS or mm -hmm. active secondary progressive? Sure. Um, the only um, treatment that has been approved for primary progressive MS is Ocrevus, Ocrelizumab. It is a um, IV infusion. It's a monoclonal antibody. The IV infusion is every 24 weeks. Initially, you have a half a dose. Two weeks later, you get another dose. And um, it is one of the only treatments where we can see improvement in a primary progressive or relapse. It's approved for relapsing, remitting, and relapsing mm -hmm. forms of MS2. Um, some of the side effects to Ocrevus is not uh, there is um, infusion reaction because when you start that infusion, um, the medication is uh, licensing or eliminating uh, B cells with the 20, uh, CD20 marker and it does it very quickly and so you may get dizzy, you may get a rash, you may get shortness of breath, you may get overwhelming fatigue, but you may get a, um, an infusion reaction. The infusion reactions are pretty um, common in the very first infusion, mm -hmm. but they decrease significantly on the second infusion, and the longer you're on it, the infusion reactions go away. Another side effect that can occur is upper and lower respiratory infections. Um, even in patients, though, that have chronic bronchitis or um, a COPD, we, we don't really see a lot of uh, upper respiratory infections, um, but we do see more infusion reactions. So um, the most significant um, side effects to Ocrevus is um, a possibility of malignancy. So in the clinical trials, there were six patients who developed breast cancer that didn't occur uh, in the uh, other drugs that were being um, uh, uh, compared to Ocrevus. And so we do a preliminary workup to ensure that they don't have the risk of, of breast cancer. So we encourage our patients to have those normal uh, workups and uh, take care of themselves um, gradually and see their primary care physician for those. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. And then there's Mazent, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mazent just came out. Mazent is like, it's similar to Gelinia. It, um, it is uh, dosed, um, uh, once a day, um, you can. It can affect the liver. It's an oral agent. Can affect the liver, um, but the workup is, and it can cause macular edema. Can cause um, increase in blood pressure, a low heart rate, um, and so you have to. The patient has to have a uh, workup, a very significant mm -hmm. workup. We have them see a, a dermatologist for assessment of their skin. We have them see a pulmonologist, make sure they don't have respiratory problems. We see that they have to see an um, ophthalmologist to make sure they have no macular edema. Mm -hmm. And they do have to have an EKG <coughs> to make sure that there's no uh, untoward um, issues cardiac wise that we that were unknown to the patients. So they have that workup and then they have to be monitored on the first dose just like with Gelania uh, for any cardiac problems. It is it can affect the liver as well and it is approved for um, active secondary progressive as well as relapsing forms of MS. Great, thank you. And then we have, okay, then we have Mavinclad. Right. So Mavinclad is cladribine. It's been studied for many years. I think back in 2003 when we were studying Mavinclad and its effect on MS, it is an immunosuppressant that was used in cancer uh, treatment many years ago. It is um, dosed orally and it is weight-based. And so, the, but it um, comes in two courses for two years and then after that two years uh, you don't have to take it again so the first year it may be dosed uh, four uh, tablets or it may be dosed five tablets you take it one four days a week five days a week and then one month later you take the second course and then 43 about no less than 43 weeks after that you take another uh, set of courses so you do have to watch for malignancies although in the clinical trials um, there were um, 10 malignancies, various types of cancer, um, and 13,000 patients 
uh, research because it's been studied for so long. And there hasn't been any um, malignancy since it came on the market. It can stress the liver and uh, we do have to watch for any signs of, of cancers while they're on that, that drug. So. Okay, thank you for that. Um, tell me about the challenges faced in progressive MS. Oh, there's many challenges with progressive <clears throat> MS. So Let's go with the top five. Okay. Um, you want to talk about primary progressive? Primary, or progressive? primary progressive patients because they have fewer inflammatory lesions. So we don't see as many lesions on the brain, but mm -hmm. we see more lesions in the spinal cord. So because they have spinal cord lesions, they often have a progressive uh, a gait that mm -hmm. progresses over time, their ability to walk. They have more bowel and bladder symptoms. They tend to have um, more cognitive decline, and we think that's because primary progressive MS may uh, be in, uh, initiated in the gray matter, and there's more uh, disability in the gray that can occur from the gray matter disease. So um, there may, again, there'll be bowel and bladder dysfunctions, more sensory symptoms, and over time they need more caregiving. And so we, once we know they have primary progressive, and that may be that may take time, a mm -hmm. year or two. Uh, then we start planning for um, care partnering and such because they will need that over time. Okay, great. Thank okay. you. Um, myelin restoration. Oh, big oh, topic. Big now. topic. Mm -hmm. Big topic that we have to answer more. Very quickly. Yeah, very So, quickly. very quickly, remyelination is the topic, excuse me. And um, so, um, there's a lot of study in stem cells. Um, the biggest stem cell uh, being studied now is mesenchymal stem cells. So what they do is they take a bone marrow from possibly the hip bone, because it's big, and they take the stem cells out of the bone marrow. They do a process which is very complicated, and they plan to give that, those stem cells, IV or intrathecal. And they say now that um, the, the effect of, the positive effect from mesenchymal stem cell transplantation occurs depending on how it's processed and what route you give it. I think they're seeing better response from uh, the intrathecal, which goes right into the spinal cord. Um, and then um, it's very interesting because in Iran, uh, they're studying um, uh, fingolimod as possible uh, to have possible positive effects on remyelination. That's in early stages of study. And then uh, Scott Newsom at John Hopkins is studying the effect of a thyroid drug that's given for low thyroid disease. Mm -hmm. And that's in early stages, but they because thyroid function uh, encourages um, remyelination. They're studying that now. So, but p the most um, mostly studied and for the recent years is stem cells. So we're going to get there one day. We should. <laughs> we definitely should. Can you please tell us the difference between disease management and symptom yes, management? Yes, symptom management. So there's basically three ways we manage the disease. One is um, uh, disease modifying therapies that manages the overall disease to decrease the effects um, of MS. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have symptom management, which are drugs that, and there are a lot of them, it may not even be a drug, it may be physical therapy, occupational therapy um, that we in include, it may be otology, um, the um, I'm trying to think of what they're called, but those that make adaptive equipment, all of those go into caring for symptom management. And so we, we manage the disease, we use medications to manage symptoms, and then we manage relapses. And typically we manage relapses with um, um, IV solumedrol, or now we have Acthar gel, and a lot of patients prefer that. And then, um, I think that's the main three ways that okay. we manage it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Um, can you please tell our audience what some of the cognitive challenges are mm -hmm. that may be experienced when you are progressing? Yes, so some of the cognitive progression uh, includes a very commonly short-term memory. And so patients will note that um, they're forgetting uh, things that uh, they never forgot before, like uh, driving to a place that they are familiar with, uh, or 
and they can't find it, they get lost, they have accidents, um, they may not be able to balance their account or their checkbook. Most people don't use checkbooks anymore. Um, but they have difficulties with um, things in the home, managing mm -hmm. um, house cleaning, managing uh, children, forgetting to pick up the kids from school, um, and all of those. And so um, over time, their quality of life is significantly decreased. And sometimes we, they don't share it with us when they come in, but the, most commonly the family shares it with us. And sometimes, as you said before, the patients may not recognize it. So. Right. So how does this impact? I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to keep up with why you might be progressing. Mm -hmm. um, and for those that have memory issues, I mean, yeah. how do they even remember that, they're, right. that they might be progressing? Right. But how also does this affect their workplace it or does even work. their relationships? So, you know, very often relationships is, is very significant, but then the workplace, they find that they are forgetting things. They're using more post-it notes at work. They're getting uh, performance evaluations that are negative. And we tell our patients, as soon as you start noticing things uh, that are going badly at work or you get a bad review, you need to come in and if you feel at any time your job is at risk, we want to see that patient mm -hmm. because we will probably be doing ongoing, we do a lot of cognitive screening in the office, so we shouldn't be very surprised. We may need a neuropsych evaluation. We take that person out of work and we uh, put them on leave so that we can do the, the mm. whole cognitive workup. Because we want our neuropsychologists to identify if they can work and if they can't, we don't want them to lose their benefits and sure. that's significant. So. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. And thank you for this interview. You're very right? welcome. Now we're going to switch to Q&A. Okay. You know, so okay. we're up to that next. Okay, okay. Well, thank you for being You're here today. You're very welcome, Stuart, anytime. Thank you. you enjoyed that, that great interview and so I'm receiving all of your questions and before we get started with the questions and answers with Connie Eastern I'd like to introduce you and, and say welcome so welcome um, to you Connie thank you for being with us here sure. tonight oh thank you Jennifer I'm so happy to be here absolutely and um, we do have a lot of questions that we've received um, some of them are more specific than others, but we'll just get started. Um, okay. Somebody is asking um, if there are any MS treatments or disease modifying therapies that are not considered to be immunosuppressing or an immunosuppressant. If there are any immunosuppressive or not, uh, I'm sorry, what's the question? If there are any that are immunosuppressant? No, if there are any, um, Maybe there just needs to be some clarification on, on um, if there are any immuno, any disease modifying therapy drugs that are not considered to be immunosuppressive. Well, most of them are not considered to be immunosuppressive. We have some that are immunomodulators. We have um, some that are um, immunosuppressant. In fact, one of the newest drugs, Mavenclad, is an immunosuppressant. And then, um, but most of the drugs are immunomodulators. So the ones that are immunomodulators are glutarimer acetate, interferons, and natalizumab. And then immunomodulators are dimethyl fumarate or tecfidera, diroxamyl fumarate, or uh, vumeridy, fingolimod, um, siponimod, and abagio. The immunosuppressant drugs are considered those that deplete uh, cells, like alemtuzumab, mavenclad, an immunosuppressant, mitoxantrum we don't use anymore because it has severe risk, uh, such as uh, malignancies. And then ocrelizumab is not a true immunosuppressant, but it does deplete B cells and some T cells. So uh, it is in the classification of immunosuppressant. Okay, great. Thank you for, for clarifying all of that it's a lot. Um, and I think that the question is is being followed up with, uh, this is a, out of concern for COVID-19. Um, if I mm -hmm. am on a disease modifying therapy that is an immunosuppressing um, choice, 
would I be able to take the vaccine once they uh, discover a vaccine for COVID-19? And I, I guess you that's know that's right. That's a very that's a very good question, and we really, um, you know, now uh, the flu shot patients that are on treatment can take a flu shot. We don't know yet until the vaccine comes out and it's studied. In fact, there are several makers of the vaccines now and they're in clinical trial. And so it may take a while before we know if there's going to be any risk uh, to the patients who need to take it. So I really can't answer that question at this time. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, somebody's asking, and I guess, Connie, you must... Um, must find this with a lot of the patients that you see, they're having a lot of fear about um, going for their infusion therapy, um, either to the infusion center or uh, if they receive it in a hospital setting. What are you recommending uh, for your patients and, and how can a patient uh, or person uh, protect themselves at this time when they're going for their therapy? Infusion. Well, if you if you are already on an infusion therapy like ocrelizumab, we have an infusion center in our office, so this question has been coming up even though we're in an office setting. And most of our doctors are doing telemedicine from home, but we do have an infusion center and it has remained open. Uh, one thing that um, our nurse is doing is she's only having one or two patients uh, infused at the same time. They don't come, they don't get near each other. You should go, whether you're in a hospital setting or an outpatient uh, setting, you should always wear a mask when you go in, wear gloves when you go in, and the infusion nurse will take care of you from that point. Now, um, I've had several questions this week about uh, from patients who have not contacted COVID-19 and should they go ahead and have their um their infusion. One patient didn't want to go into the infusion room. She wanted to use one of my exam rooms. She didn't want to be anywhere near another patient. So people are afraid. However, if you are on a an infusion now, you should go ahead and get that infusion. If, if you're, you've been on this drug for a while, we don't want you to stop it. Now, there are some like natalizumab, you can spread out. You might not take it for six or eight weeks. Um, however, ocrelizumab is once every six months, and you need to keep that schedule uh, timely. Now, whether or not you should delay that, I did delay a patient this week for four weeks, but she was an individual case. Those decisions are made on an individual basis. So your doctor will check your recent lab work. He'll see if there's any indication of immunosuppression, such as low white count, and then he'll make that decision whether he delays the infusion or goes forward. But use all the precautions that um, the MS Society has put out, the CDC has put out, whether, no matter where you go, whether you're going to an infusion center or a hospital setting, you should use those precautions. Oh, thank you so much, Connie, for clarifying that and for giving people a lot more uh, calm, calm feeling in regards to that. Um, I know there's a lot of worry. Um, yes, yeah, and Jennifer, yeah. okay, we do want our patients to continue treatment. So if you've been on treatment and you've been doing well, if everything's okay, keep going and doing keep stay on your treatment however if this is your first infusion or you haven't started treatment yet there may be a recommendation for delaying that i'm sorry i didn't say that before but i just want to get that in okay that's good well that's actually one of one of the or a couple of the questions are if i'm about to start a new disease modifying therapy at this time um do you, is that something you recommend it yeah and, in light of in light of COVID-19, the um, if you're going to go on, um, let's say, uh, um, a uh, interferon, or if you're going to go on Copaxone, or one of those, there is no risk. There shouldn't be any risk. You should go ahead and go on it. But if it is one of the um, immune depleting drugs like alemtuzumab, cladribine. Uh, or ocrelizumab, there may, your doctor may want you to delay that. And so that would mean you should call your doctor before you start. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question from Amanda, and she is, uh, wants us to know that she's had increased weakness, fatigue. She feels like she's falling asleep all the time, and now she mm -hmm. has new uh, leg weakness. 
sleepiness and she's not able to focus. Um, she wants to know if, if I guess, if this is going to be a relapse or how will she know if something, if symptoms like this are a relapse? Well, if she has relapsing and remitting MS and she has those symptoms and she was my patient, uh, I would immediately get an MRI and I would see her in the clinic because those are symptoms of relapse. Very often when you're relapsing, cognition declines. That's a very common symptom in a relapse. Fatigue can get worse. And then weakness in any extremity um, or extremities can mean that there's a lesion somewhere either in the brain or the spinal cord. So she needs further evaluation, and um, I would recommend that she call her doctor. Now, if he's doing telemedicine and he thinks she may be relapsing, knowing her history, um, he may go ahead and treat her for relapse if she usually takes steroids or act or gel, whichever. Um, but that determination would be made by him. But those symptoms that she just you just mentioned do sound like a relapse. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, answering that question. And you mentioned telemedicine. Um, some of the people that are writing in are saying that they can only see their healthcare provider through telemedicine. Can you kind of go through what that can be like? Sure. That just as a sure. perspective of going in to see uh, the person sure. in real life, there's some concerns about that. Right. So, um, when we, of course, I know my patients. So, when I do a telemedicine uh, a call with them, it usually lasts at least 30 minutes. Uh, we go over any new symptoms, any old symptoms, anything changed since their last appointment. We talk about what treatments they're on. Are there any side effects? Are, what are their medications? Other medications are on? I always want to know if they have another diagnosis because remember, comorbidities can be a big issue, especially with COVID-19. So if you've got newly diagnosed lung disease or heart disease, these are things we need to know. However, I go through all of that and then uh, we go through their medications. Um, now, some doctors have gotten really creative and I'm starting to get that creative in that you can actually on TV, on a, your computer or whatever, whatever you're using, you can actually examine a patient. You can have them um, go back to where you can see them and they can do a, um, a tandem gait. They can move all of their extremities. They can do, uh, you, they can do point to point finger to nose. They can actually do point to point heel to shin. So you can actually watch them do, go through those examination, um, exercises that we do in the clinic. Um, it's not as perfect, of course, and it's not as, um, accurate possibly but if you have any concerns about the patient uh you can go through those you can't look at the optic nerves of course and you can't go through all of the um the uh cranial nerve examinations might be more difficult but we're getting very creative in how we uh can examine patients on telemedicine the only reason we're doing it that way is because they're so uh, much uh, risk for people going in a clinic. We don't want them to catch COVID-19 and we don't want to get COVID-19, of, of course. So when COVID-19 first came out, um, we started taking the temperature of every person who came into our waiting room, asking them if they had traveled. And my very first patient that day, had a temperature. He had just come from a cruise and he was, and he was, uh, had an upper respiratory infection. And of course we didn't see him, but then all the other patients got upset in the waiting room that he'd come in. So, um, we're trying to avoid that. We, this is a protection for our patients as well as for ourselves. So. Well, thank you for, for clarifying that and kind of explaining how it would go. So someone uh, wouldn't hesitate to call their healthcare provider office and, and, do, and make an appointment even through telemedicine. Um, a lot of people are, are worried about missing out on their appointments. Um, sure, and let me just say, Jennifer, the, 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 they do get charged for a, tele, a telephone me, uh, video or telemedicine mm -hmm. appointment, but it's not as much. It's very low cost. And so, but you should do it if you need refills, um, if you're having any problems with anything, you should actually do it. You'll find it very informative. Wonderful. Thank you.
And um, sure. what, what are your recommendations for patients that are needing MRIs right now? I and mean, someone is writing that they had to cancel their MRI. They're very concerned about that. Um, right. They want- and they, and they, yeah, and they should be. So um, if I have patients and it's time for their uh, annual lab work or their lab work at a period of time, at a particular time, and it's time for their MRIs, um, I, and, and it's just routine MRIs, follow-up MRIs, I delay them. I'm say, I tell them I'm going to order them now, but we're not going to do them until June or July. And so the patients are very, they are very happy about that. I really don't want them to go to the lab right now for routine labs because not only is it a risk for them to be around uh, other people, but um, the labs are very busy right now, and it's, it's really, it would, it, it, the line, I understand that it takes a long time to get seen if you're just a routine patient. So we do, we're delaying that unless there's a particular reason to go forward. If the patient's relapsing, they're not doing well, there are symptoms of side effects to medications, or there's a particular reason we need uh, those labs, uh, we, might, uh, we might go forward with that. But I haven't seen that. Uh, over the past few weeks with my with my patients. Okay, great, thank you. And um, I have another question. Um, this person was diagnosed 10 years ago and moved from walking four miles a day to today having limited mobility. But mm-hmm. when they get to use their um, stationary bicycle, the mobility is uh, has improved. And they're asking why why someone would have these issues I, I'm assuming in relation to progression or, or why they would uh, with that mobility on, on the stationary bike versus not being able to walk well. right so you're using different muscles on a stationary bike versus walking walking is um, very hard on the back and it's very hard on the legs and of course it just how far you walk plays part of that uh, a stationary bike you can you can sit and you use different muscles for that so it might be easier to do however if you're having that kind of change that and you feel like you are having some movement uh, progression or decrease in movement uh, you need to be evaluated someone who has relapsing remitting uh, MS for 10 years may be in the point of transitioning to secondary progressive phase. We do know that secondary progressive uh, phase can or transition can occur anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 years after the diagnosis. 10 years is a little early, but it can occur. and most often occurs in people who are, you know, right around uh, uh, 40 years old. It could be earlier. It could be in the second um uh, uh, generation of life. It can be in the fourth generation of life. It, it's just hard to say. But anytime there is progression, but not symptoms of a necessary of a relapse, uh, that needs to be evaluated. Um, so um, it's it's really hard to to diagnose secondary progressive. But if there's some slow progression over time, and you originally were relapsing and remitting, and you're not having relapses, and you may not show any lesions on MRI, then secondary progressive needs to be evaluated. And a relapse, ah, if, that's, if that's yeah. OK. OK, and uh, I have another question of someone asking if beta serum is, an, is immunosuppressive. No, it is not. I mean, uh, Beta seron is in the classification of an immunomodulator. Uh, beta seron, the interferons work by blocking those uh, cells that try to break down the blood brain barrier. They never enter the central nervous system. They work in the periphery and they do not cause a decrease in your white blood cell count. So the interferons generally can challenge the liver. And so we check liver enzymes and occasionally they may cause the white blood cell to slightly decrease, but that's very rare and it is not considered an immunosuppressive. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, just a reading here. Um, someone yes. is asking, uh, uh, you, how do you recommend uh, to speak with children uh, about your progression uh, with your children? Uh, if, right. So, 
activities. Yeah. Right. So with, with children, uh, and you know, it's interesting about kids whose parents have most or, or a parent has multiple sclerosis. So very often we think we're hiding things from them. Those kids are very smart and they always know when something's wrong or you're worried about something. So it's better to get it out in the open. And you can start because they probably know that you have a chronic disease and you can just start by saying that things are changing a little bit. You're having a little bit more difficulty time getting around. Um, and of course, nobody's doing sports right now, but it may be harder for you to go to ball games and such when uh, they do come back. And you just have to be open and honest with the child. If you try to hide it, it's going to make them afraid. I, I find that more um, things that we hide from kids uh, causes fear. And you don't have to tell them everything. You have to base what you tell them on their age level. So teenagers are really uh, more aware than you think of what's going on. And sometimes you just have to say, you know, I'm having trouble uh, walking and I want you to t uh, take out the trash now. I want you to take on more responsibilities. And kids are always very uh, willing to help uh, a parent who has some, who has a chronic disease. That's great. Thank you. And, and I'm going to, yeah, um, I'm going to, to, to wrap it up uh, with, with a final question I have here. Um, okay. Does MS cause you to have an overactive immune system? And um, would that protect me in some way from the COVID-19? You know, I meant to bring, bring that up in another question, and I was just sitting here thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So I had um, four patients contact me today wanting letters to be out of work um, or work from home because uh, they were afraid they were going to be at risk for COVID and what it would do uh, to their system. And many of them thought that they had immunosuppression because they had the diagnosis of MS. MS is a disease of an overactive immune system. It's a, it's an autoimmune disease, and most people get autoimmune diseases like diabetes and thyroid dysfunction, uh, and others because their their immune systems are overactive. So, um, it it. It, I can't say that it will protect you because people do with MS do get um, infections. They do occur. And it depends, too, very often on how challenged your immune system is. So I'm 71, and so I have other diseases. I don't have MS, but I have other diseases. So my immune system is very challenged. And so when you have MS and then you have heart disease or you have asthma or you have a renal disease or kidney disease, it makes it more difficult for your immune system to work like it did when you were a young person. That's called immunosenescence, when the immune system cannot keep up with all the diagnoses that you have. So, um, so in some people, they might be more apt to get COVID-19 because their immunity is not what it should be because they have so many diagnoses. We call those comorbidities. And then other people who have had MS for 20 years, 30 years, and their health is really good otherwise, they may have um, a really good immunity. However, COVID-19 is a virulent um, virus that is um, easy to catch because it's airborne. So when someone is a respiratory virus, so when people speak, uh, they very often spray particles from their mouth. Uh, when they cough, they spray particles from their mouth. When they blow their nose, they spray particles from their nose. And so um, the risk of getting that is very high. But um, Many people are walking around, they've been exposed, and they have the virus, but they have no symptoms. So it's very hard to say um, if you would be at greater risk for uh, catching COVID. It's a very, it would be very individualized, actually. But in, in, at any rate, everybody should take the same precautions. Everybody should wear a mask when you're out. Everybody should wear gloves when they're out. And... Um, 
uh, if they cough, cough into their arm. Uh, if they're uh, if they're covered, that's okay. You you don't have to cough into your arm, but you cough into your mask. And wash your hands, even if you're not doing anything in your house. Every couple times, every day, you should wash your hands for 20 minutes with soap and water. You should take antimicrobial um, wipes like Clorox wipes and wipe down areas that are commonly touched in your home. I have a 17-year-old grandson living with me. I have a 24-year-old grandson living with me, and I have a daughter who goes to work every day. Uh, she works in medicine as well. And so, there, uh, you know, my daughter's coming and going. So the risk of bringing COVID-19 into the home by accident is very great. So it's very important that you as an individual take precautions uh, to prevent you bringing it home and prevent yourself from catching it when you're outside. Oh, thank you so much, Connie, for sharing all of this information with all of us. We had a lot of people on the line, and I know that you brought a lot of peace and reassurance to, to so many, and we are very grateful. Good. Thank you. Good. Good. Oh, you're welcome. And Jennifer, you asked me a question earlier about um, being afraid to go to the doctor when you don't get your labs or your MRIs that were ordered. Is that Was that a question earlier? Yeah, Did why? you ask me about this? Yes. Yeah, so I just want to say can I just answer that for a minute? So um, I have patients who keep their appointments on a regular basis, and sometimes they forgot they were supposed to get their lab done, or they couldn't afford to get their MRIs done, and they didn't do it. So we're very non-judgmental, judgmental. I mean, and we, um, you know, I don't always remember what I ordered. So when before I see you, I have to run look at what I did last time and what I ordered because you know we do see a lot of patients. So we don't, we don't, uh, we're not judgmental. So we do, a rec if we recommend that you have an MRI or labs and you haven't had them yet, we may recommend that you go ahead and have them. Of course, right now, we're not going to recommend that, probably, unless it's urgent. But um, don't be afraid to go into your doctor's office. I, I don't know any of my doctors. I work with six doctors, and I don't know any of them that would be angry. So um, uh, I would go ahead and keep your appointment, especially now. It's very important for you to, to you know, see how, let them note how healthy you are and if they make any other recommendations. But don't ever be afraid to go in because the important thing is that you be safe. And, and I wouldn't worry about uh, uh, getting labs and MRIs that were ordered at the previous visit. Okay. okay? Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Connie. And I, You're welcome. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, in conclusion, um, we um, are going to be sending out a, a brief survey after the webinar is over. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. We'd love to hear your questions for our next uh, webinar. Our next webinar is going to be on May 5th, Tuesday, May 5th, uh, with Dr. Brian Sango, and he will be discussing more detail on MS treatment options and what we know today, and I think uh, a very interesting topic in lieu of all of the things that are happening right now. I know that there's a lot of concern and questions. So that will be uh, a month from now, May 5th, and we hope that you can all join us. Um, all of these webinars are recorded. You'll be able to find this on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe on YouTube to the MS News and News Learning channel. Um, we have over 3,500 people there um, learning so we hope that you can do that as well. And you can also um, visit us at www.msdsandnews.org and join us on Facebook and Instagram. We love seeing everybody and everyone be safe and be well. Um, and we'll see you and hear you and talk next month. Okay, thank you. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>